Dr. Laffer is the founder and chairman of Laffer Associates, which is an economic research and consulting firm based in Nashville, Tennessee. Since its inception in, in 1979, the firm's research has focused on interconnecting macroeconomic, political, and demographic changes affecting global financial markets. Dr. Laffer's career has been marked by great experience and success in business, public policy, and as an academic economist and professor. His economic thinking and influence in triggering a worldwide tax cutting movement in the 1980s earned him the distinction in many publications as the father of supply side economics. One of his earliest successes in shaping public policy was his involvement in Prop 13, the groundbreaking California initiative that drastically cut property taxes in the state in 1978. Dr. Laffer is also a member of President Ronald Reagan's Economic Policy Advisory Board for both terms in the White House. He is a member of the Executive Committee of the Reagan-Bush Finance Committee in 84 and was a founding member of the Reagan Executive Advisory Committee for the presidential race in 1980. He's been widely acknowledged for his economic achievements. He was noted in Time Magazine's 1999 cover story, The Century's Greatest Minds, for inventing the Laffer Curve, which is deemed one of the few of the advances that powered this extraordinary century. He was listed at a dozen who shaped the 80s in the Los Angeles Times in 1990 and a gallery of the greatest people who influence our daily business in the Wall Street Journal in 1989. In recent years, he's advised numerous leaders across the country on tax policy, international trade, and on other areas. Among the long list, these leaders include Governors Scott Walker and Sam Brownback, Senators Rand Paul and Ted Cruz, and of course, President Donald Trump. Dr. Laffer is a popular campus speaker for the Young Americans Foundation, a co-sponsor of this event, and the premier national youth organization focused on advancing the ideas of individual freedom, limited government, and free enterprise. Dr. Laffer is joining us today as part of the Young American Freedom's Thomas W. Smith Foundation Free Enterprise Lecture Series. He enjoys engaging with students and campus communities and discussing the critical economic issues facing America tonight. And I can say after spending the last hour with him, you're in for a treat. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Arthur Laffer. Thank you very much, Mr. President. It is a pleasure. I, kept, I was walking down the hall. I thought it was starting at 6.30. And I was coming down, and there was clapping going on at 6.20, and I figured he must have just announced that I didn't show up. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> no, it's, it's fun. Uh, there is one fun story of that. Can I tell a little Reagan story? Is it fair? I got Reagan, this, the Cuban American National Foundation in Miami. Uh, had President Reagan come down and speak at the Miami Bowl there, and it was just filled, I mean, as you can imagine, just all the way up to the gullets. There are people waiting outside and all this stuff, and they had Reagan come up and give his talk, and he did. He went up and gave his talk, and, you know, there was nice, nice, wonderfully receptive audience, politely clapping and stuff like that, and um, then he went and sat down, and then this guy got up and, speaking in Spanish, was giving this talk, and every other sentence, the place goes, Rah! And crashes and booms and everyone cheering and screaming and loud and Reagan was sitting there and it sort of didn't know what to do. He didn't understand what was happening, but he felt sort of awkward. Everyone else was cheering what's going on that he decided he should cheer and go on too. So every time everyone else started, he would go clapping too. And one of the guys came over and said, excuse me, Mr. President, I, I wouldn't clap if I were you. He said, why not? He said, they're translating your speech. <laughs> So I was hearing this. It's fun, isn't it? Uh, one last story. Can I start? Is it all right to have a little fun with this group? Is, is it fair? All right. It's great having being here at Patrick Henry. I mean, it is. In front of my dorm at Yale was a statue of Patrick Henry. By the way, I just want you to know, in the old campus there, so I am familiar with Patrick Henry, and I love it. Uh, I moved from California to Nashville, Tennessee. 12 years ago, 13 years ago. Can any of you guess why? <laughs> Taxes! You know, I, I go, again, I don't want to complicate you, and I don't want to do heavy math with you tonight, but if you have two locations, A and B, and they raise taxes in B and lower them in A, 
producers and manufacturers and people are going to move from to am I you're with me on that that's that's not too I tell the people at Harvard this and they go huh, I don't get it art the sun shines better I mean it's just just you know you know why Harvard professors have round shoulders and flat foreheads he asks them a question and they go you tell them the answer and they go <laughs> I've got to I've got to tell you, though, the, the Schwarzenegger thing. I do miss a little bit of California. I miss Schwarzenegger. Not that he was a good governor. He wasn't. He was horrible. Not that he wasn't a good man. He was a horrible man besides. All of that's true, but he was entertaining. I mean, wildly entertaining. And the first time I got to spend some personal time, he asked me to come up to his home in L.A. and to have breakfast with him. And um, so I did. And I, I had met him a number of times, but never had a conversation with him, just passing, you know, say hello, and that's about it. And I'd heard he had this, you know, wicked, insightful wit, and it was devastating in conversation. So I prepared myself. I, I figured my best defense was an aggressive offense, okay? So I go in there, and we're meeting outside in the patio, and he's sitting there. And uh, I, I just decided to just unleash myself. I said, you know, Arnold, I can't tell you how grateful and how happy I am to be here with you and that you're running for governor. I can't begin to tell you how excited I am. You know, and I was just over the moon with delight when I found out you, you had Wilson and Buffett as your advisors. I was just so excited by that until I found out it wasn't Owen and Jimmy. When I found out it was Pete and Warren, and he goes to me, he goes, ha, 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 you know. And about two minutes later, he looks, he says, Asa, why is it all you clear sinking economists are so short? Where does that come from? I mean, come on, where is that? He said, no, no, it's true. Milton Friedman, he can't be more than four feet, six inches tall, little bitty, tiny man. And you know, you Asa, you remind me of Donnie DeVito. You know, I starred with him in Twins, so I do miss Schwarzenegger. I do miss California, all of that, but I'm really glad. I want to take you on a little just journey, though, for a quick second here, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. I wrote a book about four years ago called The Wealth of States, uh, and it is a 30,000-foot uh, view of uh, the U.S. state system. Not many economists write about it. And if you look at it, we have 50 states in this wonderful country of ours. Uh, in each of those states, we have, let's 70 to 80 counties. In each of those counties, we have two, three, four municipalities. We have a data trove that is absolutely incredible, 100 years worth of data. And virtually anything that can be done has been done. I mean, Idaho did it in 1954. Uh, uh, Rhode Island did it in 1957. You know, it's just amazing there. And yet, if you talk to state legislators, governors, or anyone involved in state and local government, they have not a clue. I mean, they really, some of them may know something like Prop 13 that you mentioned about, but none of them have any idea of what the performances are of these. So what I decided to do in this book was compile sort of an overview of states. And it's fascinating because it is a treasure trove of data and it illustrates. I mean, we have a common currency, we have a common language, we have no barriers to the movement of people and goods. It's just a beautiful, beautiful model of what happens with economics and how economics does it. And, and the first chapter I wrote is, is called The Fall from Grace, which I'm going to go through with you for a second. The second one, I just that you know my grandson, my grandchildren were involved in this. The second one is the nine members of the Lord of the Rings to offset the nine Nazgul. You know, the Lord, there are nine states with no income tax, and there are nine states with the highest income tax. It's a comparison of those two there. I go on and do these, but let me, if I can, do uh, the fall from grace. Since 1960, there have been 11 states in the United States that have introduced the income tax, state income tax. Today, there are nine states that do not have an income tax. Back then, in 1960, there were 20 states that did not have an income tax. You, you all with me? These are 11 states that introduced it. Now, they're not weirdo states. I mean, the first one in 1961 was West Virginia. The most recent one was in Connecticut in 1991. But there are other states like Maine and Rhode Island. Both of them introduced an income tax in that interview. Uh, you have New Jersey. 
you have Pennsylvania, you have Ohio, you have Indiana, you have Illinois, you have, uh, uh, you have uh, Michigan, you have Nebraska. I mean, these are all sort of normal states. You with me on this? What I decided to do was to lake, take a look at what happened to these states that introduced the income tax. Fair, fair question? And here's a natural experiment that took place. What I did was I got the primary metrics for each of these states. Now remember, they all did it in different years. So I got the met primary metrics of each of these states. Uh, three years before they did it, two years before and one year before. So I looked at the three years before the income tax was put into place. I looked at population relative to the rest of the nation. I looked at gross state product relative to the rest of the nation, employment. I looked at all these other tax, tax, uh, state and local tax revenues relative to the nation. I looked at all the primary metrics of these states three years before they introduced the income tax. And then what I did was I took the most recent three years and looked at what's happened. And let's just take a look at it. You, you follow me in this? I looked at what they were doing beforehand, and then I look at where it is right now. Now, this was four years ago, but it's the same difference. All right. Let me just tell you that each and every one of these states, without a single exception, in each and every one of the economic metrics, declined relative to the rest of the nation. Let me say it again. Each state in every metrics declined relative to the rest of the nation, and some of them by a lot. Some of them collapsed. For example, Michigan, when Romney introduced the income tax, uh, was 5.2% of the U.S. economy. Today, Michigan is 2.7% of the U.S. economy. That is a collapse. Uh, if you look at summer, my home state of Ohio, same thing exactly happened, just a devastation, like a tornado hit it. it it's amazing. The one I, I like most of all, though, is New Jersey. And I, I want to tell you about New Jersey, because you all know New Jersey, don't you? You know New Jersey. You know, the, uh, what the, the, uh... In 1965, New Jersey had neither an income tax nor a sales tax, neither one. No income tax, no sales tax. Can you imagine? It was the fastest growing state in the nation. People from everywhere were migrating to New Jersey, and they had a budget surplus. Nine years ago, when my student at the University of Chicago was, uh, was the governor of New Jersey, a guy named John Corzine, I uh, was governor of New Jersey. By the way, and just to be transparent and um, upfront, um, he was a student of mine, but he was a C student. <laughs> and after reading about all the corruption uh, with regards to MF Global, I'm not even sure he earned the C. Um, but he was, they had raised the highest property taxes, highest income taxes, highest sales taxes, most regulation in any state, slowest growing state in the nation. Uh, people were leaving like rats off a sinking ship, and they had a huge budget deficit. How did they do that? Um, it is amazing, but let me just tell you, you cannot balance the budget on the backs of the poor, the unemployed, and people who leave your state. You just can't. You can't tax a state into prosperity. It just doesn't work. But this chapter there, I then go through all the public services. Uh, they, they not only didn't get the revenues they wanted, they also lost out on the public services as well. They declined in the provision of public services. It, it's a catastrophe in this. But if any of you get a chance to look at The Wealth of States, my book, The Wealth of States, you, you might find it interesting in just seeing what actually does happen uh, rather than just talking about it theoretically. Now, what I want to do with you right now is, is go through a, another little topic with you that is playing, uh, is playing very big role uh, in the U.S. Uh, we are having a very major conversation uh, with the rest of the world about international trade. And this is my specialty area, and I have spent a lot of time organizing sort of key facts of international trade that I think you might find fun, all right? And it's very important that I called my paper uh, two to the power of two squared which are for you who are math whizzes at 16, um, facts on trade. 
And I'm going to go through a couple of these with you. Let me just say that the U.S. budget deficit and the U.S. national debt, they are the legal liabilities of U.S. citizens, U.S. taxpayers, and they are your liabilities, period. When the government overspends and the debt is taken in, the American taxpayers are liable for those debts, period. No one is liable for a penny's worth of trade debt unless they personally incurred it, period. There is no comparison whatsoever between trade debt and the national debt. All these comparisons of the twin deficits and all of that stuff is just plain hooey. It makes no If I borrow, if I lend money to a Nisei or a Sensei in San Francisco or to an ethnic Japanese in Hokkaido, the only one responsible for that debt is the guy I lent the money to and me. No American is in any way, shape, or involved in that debt whatsoever. All comparisons of debt as the national debt versus trade debt, totally inappropriate and totally inappropriate with respect to policies. The U.S. federal government has no involved, should have no involvement whatsoever in the, in the trade debt and 100 percent involvement in the national debt. All of you with me on that? You follow it? It's really important. Very few people understand that these two deficits and debts aren't related. They're not related in any way, shape, or form. With me? Number two, the U.S. trade deficit can only occur, uh, the U.S. trade deficit with China, for example, can only occur when the Chinese invest more in the U.S. than the U.S. economy invests in China. All right? The trade deficit, which is U.S. imports exceeding U.S. exports, is one and the same as the U.S. capital surplus. And the Chinese trade surplus is one and the same as the Chinese capital deficit. Uh, you, you follow me in that? Uh, a U.S. trade deficit with China means we win. They're, they're investing in the U.S. And even though we're buying more goods from them than we're selling to them, it's because they are investing in the U.S. Uh, when you look at it, uh, we get more investments, China's trade surplus and the U.S. trade deficit with China. The tra Chinese trade surplus with the U.S. has provided the U.S. lots and lots of capital each and every year. And if you use capital to labor ratios in that, uh, the Chinese trade deficit, trade surplus with the U.S. provides the U.S. with about one and a half million jobs net each and every year because of the capital they bring that is then available for Americans to work. Are, are you following me on that? Please do. To see why the U.S. trade deficit is good for America, ask yourself, just ask yourself, what should you rather have? Capital lined up on our borders, trying to get into our country or trying to get out of our country? Which would you rather have? Wouldn't you rather have capital trying to get into our country rather than trying to get out of our country? You know, <clears throat> the U.S. trade deficit means we are attracting investments from the rest of the world, and a U.S. trade surplus means that we are chasing capital out of the U.S. Um, it, to see this, I mean, let me just imagine, here is a guy who owns a factory uh, in southern Mexico, employs hundreds and hundreds of Mexicans, all right? Trump does his tax bills and all the stuff, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, does all this stuff, and it makes it much more attractive to invest in the U.S. This guy looks up and says, jeez, that's cool. America's much more attractive. The guy picks up his factory in Mexico, puts it on trucks, ships it over the border to the U.S., up into Colorado, puts it in a big facility in Colorado, and now starts hiring hundreds and hundreds of Americans instead of hundreds and hundreds of Mexicans down in the southern part of Mexico. Are you all with me? Is that good for the U.S.? You better believe it is. But by picking up that factory and shipping it across the U.S.-Mexican border, that is called a Mexican export and a Mexican trade surplus. It's called a U.S. import and a U.S. trade deficit. But it's also called a Mexican capital deficit and a U.S. capital surplus. This is how you attract capital into the country. It, it is really, really important that you understand that the U.S. trade deficit 
is not only not a problem, it's wonderful. Foreigners, how do foreigners generate the dollar cash flow to buy U.S. located assets when they want to invest in the United States? The only way they can do this is by selling more goods to the U.S. and buying less goods from the U.S., which generates that dollar cash flow, which then allows them to buy U.S. production facilities. That is what the U.S. trade deficit. Um, you know, when you look at these things, you can think about it in borrower's terms. And I, I, I want to just, there's nothing, nothing wrong with debt. Now, whether debt is good or bad depends upon the spread. If I said I would lend you all you want, risk-free at 2% per year, and you could invest all you want risk-free at 20% per year, how much should you borrow? Is there any limit? Borrow as much as you possibly can get your hands on. Now, reverse those numbers. You can borrow all you want at 20% and lend all you want at 2%. How much should you borrow? Zero. It's not the amount of debt you borrow. It's the spread you have that makes the difference. Two guys walk out of a bank. Both of them in there to get a loan. One of the guys got the loan. The other one didn't. Which one would you think you'd rather invest with? Am I, am I going way over your heads on this stuff? Please, good. What I want you to do is understand that um, if we owe too much to foreigners, and this is really important, if the United States owes too much to foreigners, and which has been the case historically, all we did was open up immigration and let those foreigners to whom we owed money immigrate to the United States, and then we didn't owe it to foreigners anymore. And that's true. What is it, the 5B1? The 5B1 immigration permission? If you invest 10 million in the US, you get a visa to come to the US and be as, I mean, this is what we've always done. Uh, the the uh, EB5, excuse me. The Chinese government today owns, owns $1.2 trillion of the US national debt. Now, let me just say this again. The Chinese government owns $1.2 trillion of the U.S. national debt. It's all short term. It's all 90 days at the most, 30 days, most of it, okay? It's just overnight money, very short term money. If you think about that, uh, the interest they have collected on that $1.2 trillion over the last eight, 10 years, short term interest rates have been zero. They have lent us $1.2 trillion at zero interest. Does that sound like a really bad deal to you? If you look at it with inflation adjusted, they've paid us to lend money to us. I mean, this is pretty amazing. And then you ask yourself the question, uh, if they decided they didn't want to hold that debt anymore, who would they sell it to? Who's going to buy $1.2 trillion that China decides to dump on the market? No one. They're caught. They can't get out of that position. They are literally caught owing us, uh, owing, 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 we owing them $1.2 trillion in that. You know, there's an old adage, and I, I forget who it was who said it, but it's very true. If you borrow a million dollars from the bank, the million dollars is your problem. If you borrow $100 million from the bank, that's the bank's problem. You know, China is captured in the U.S. And they just, this is the true facts about what's going on today. Because the huge Chinese investments in the U.S., we have enormous leverage over China. You know, if you think of all the Chinese investments in the U.S., the last thing investors want to do is bomb their own investments. The last thing the Chinese ever want to see happen is a collapse in the U.S. market because they'll collapse right with us. You, you please understand and hopefully get along this. Um, I want to, there are a couple of other points that are fun, but let, let me go back to you a history of that. In the early post-war period, Japan was the fastest growing country in the world and ran a trade deficit throughout that whole period. Since 1990, Japan is one of the slowest growing countries in the world and has had huge trade surpluses. 
Believe me, Japan has become a very unattractive location in this world. The reason is because of their huge tax increases and their huge increases in government spending, and they are destroying their economy amazingly. But what happens with these economies, they have trade surpluses because everyone's trying to leave the country as fast as they can. Now, <clears throat> just to give you a sense, you heard these people, you, you, what, with the Gatlin brothers? No, it's not the Gatlin brothers, it's the, the four of them that sing, my girl is American made, but she's got French blue jeans, she's got, I don't know, whatever that song is, you know, and foreigners are buying up everything in the U.S. It's not true. Foreigners are investing a lot in the U.S., but let's say U.S. wealth, is up an amazing $40 trillion in the past 10 years. And this is the Federal Reserve uh, balance sheet of the United States. U.S. net wealth is up $40 trillion from $60 trillion to $100 trillion in the last 10 years. And the cumulative, cumulative trade deficit for, from all countries is up only $2.8 trillion. These guys aren't buying all the U.S. assets and now will someday own 100% of America. Far from it. Our wealth is increasing far faster than their ownership of assets in the U.S. And in large part, our wealth is rising dramatically because of their investments in the U.S. There is no way foreigners are buying more and more of our country, leaving less and less of it for Americans. And, and the last thing I want to talk to you about trade, just so you can understand a lot of the misconceptions on trade, is from, now, I, I went back a little bit. I had better numbers a while ago, but I, I, I want to make these accurate. I made up the better numbers. Um, <clears throat> I'm an economist, after all. Come on, I'm allowed to do that. Uh, from 1747, now this is our history. From 1747 through 1854, how, how many years is that? A, is that 108 years? from 1747, before we became America, to 1854, the U.S. had 95 years of trade deficits and only 13 years of trade surpluses. We built America on foreign capital by running trade deficits and importing capital to build America. Now, of the 13 years we had trade surpluses, you may ask, what were those 13 years that we had trade surpluses? Uh, two of them were 1775 and 1776. I don't know why those foreigners decided they didn't want to invest in us, but they didn't. <laughs> All right, that's two of the years. Uh, the next ones were 11, 1811, 1812, and 1813. They decided they didn't want to invest in there. You know, Johnny Horton was going down to Louisiana with an alligator, by boom, boom, but the Redcoats were running. You know, we got them there. So they decided, during the war there, they decided not to invest in their enemy uh, there. Uh, the next one was uh, in 1842, 1843, and 1844, uh, where the U.S. had the biggest default on debt, on foreign debts. They, they had invested huge amounts in us, and then we defaulted on them, turned their debt into zero. <clears throat> That's a good trick if you can do it. We, di we did it very well. They funded all the canal bonds in the U.S. And when the second canal bond finally hit, the marginal cost of hauling thing goods dropped to zero. Uh, the thing that all the states had guaranteed the bonds, et cetera, uh, and all the foreigners lost all of their money in the funding of the canal bonds. And for some reason, I don't know why they decided for a couple of years there they didn't want to invest more in the U.S. either. Uh, Rothschild from Britain said, America will never get another penny from Europe, not a penny. And of course, that was true for about three weeks, and then they started investing in us again. I want to make sure you understand that it's not your problem, the trade deficit and the trade debt. It's not. It's not the government's problem. It's, this is the, these are the facts of trade that I want to make sure you understand when you're discussing these issues. The trade deficit is the capital surplus. It's the most wonderful thing in the world. Now I want to, I, I, I want to go to the U.S. economy, and then the last topic I want to cover with you. And uh, I want to start off by a little, can I, I'm allowed to tell a Reagan story. I am. I, I had the blessing of being uh, with Reagan for millions and millions and billions of years. Um, I tell everyone the reason I was so close with Reagan is he, uh, he asked for a congregation of economists that he could use. He had this big stage, thousands of economists on the stage. He wanted to pick a con economist that he could use. And, he looked at all the economists up there on the stage, and he said, I'll take the little short, fat one over there. Uh, th that's not exactly how I got picked. 
Um, the, uh, the way I got picked as Reagan's economist is my godfather was Ronald Reagan's best friend. Privilege really, really is nice, <laughs> especially in my case. But I was involved with Reagan for years and years and years, and, and it's true that it was privilege that I've known him socially forever. It was our little group in L.A., a uh, fun one, and I'd known him, and so when the time came, the thing, I was there. And we got along really well. I laughed at his jokes. Um, and, uh, but I got to tell you, I used to tease the real president. And forgive me, you don't mind me calling him the real president, do you? Reagan. I used to tease the real president. I used to say, you know, sir, it's my opinion as a professor, as a PhD, as an academic, that you, sir, are a certifiable genius. <laughs> now, some of my colleagues at the university don't concur in my assessment of your intellectual acumen. In fact, some of my colleagues didn't think you're very bright at all. But, that. but the one thing my colleagues and I agreed upon is that your one unique characteristic is your uncanny ability to select your four predecessors. Anyone following on the heels of Johnson, Nixon, Ford, and Carter just can't look bad. <laughs> and it's really very, very true. I mean, you know, our secret weapon in the election of 1980 was Jimmy Carter. <laughs> I mean, it was a secret weapon. In the same breath that Reagan was benefited by his four predecessors, when you look at Trump today, he has been greatly benefited by his two predecessors. W and Obama, in my opinion, were two of the single worst presidents that have ever happened in the United States. And I'm just talking economics now. I'm not talking personal character or any of that. It's just economics. If you look at real GDP per adult, detrended, you can see it, all the ones you can see during the Reagan years, it goes way up. During the Kennedy years, it goes down, way up. During uh, Eisenhower, it drops way down. Then you look at the four stooges, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, and Carter the largest assemblage of bipartisan ignorance ever put on planet Earth. You know, it just goes straight down. But then you see Reagan go boo, 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 way up. And then you see a little dip with George Herbert Walker Bush. And then it skyrockets with, with, uh, with Bill Clinton. I mean, just skyrockets. He's a great president, a disgusting person, by the way, but a great president. I'd never let my daughter intern in that White House, let me tell you. That's just not. But he was a great, great president from the standpoint of economics. He was. And then you get Obama and W. And you see that number collapse down. We have had the single largest decline in real GDP per adult detrended in recent US history. It is, we were at the beginning of 2017 at the very bottom of the trough there. You had a real low. What has happened since that time is you have had a president that has put in a huge set of policies. I was with him, I think, a week and a half ago. And my comment to him was that, you know, he has done the best job. And remember, I'm only talking economics. He's done the best job of economics in the first term of any president in recent history. I mean, really has. If you look at the policies he's put into place, uh, for example, deregulation. He's done an amazing amount of deregulation, all by executive order. It's incredible what he has done. The tax bill. And I'm going to go through the tax bill with you a little bit. The tax bill is astoundingly wonderful. If you look at prior to the Trump's tax bill, all right, U.S. corporate tax rate, statutory tax rate was 35%. It was the single highest corporate tax rate in the OECD. Now, back in 2000, 16 years earlier, it was still 35%, the U.S. tax rate, but at that time, we were the 12th highest in the OECD. Every country in the OECD, 34 countries have cut their corporate tax rate. Every country has, with one exception, Hungary, which raised its tax rate from 18% to 19%. That's it. We were the highest corporate tax rate now in 2016. And believe me, you could see the consequence of that, inversions, people losing, going, the amount of, uh, of sheltering of income, tax evasion, all of these things were going crazy during that period of time. He cut that highest tax rate from 35% to 21%, which puts us in about the middle of the pack 
of, of major countries there. That's an enormously beneficial thing for U.S. companies. Believe me when I tell you it really makes a difference in our competitiveness. In addition to cutting the corporate tax from 35 percent to 21 percent, President Trump also cut the highest personal income tax rate from their 39.6 percent to 37 percent. That again, it's not chopped liver. That's a real serious tax cut. If you were in a pass-through corporation, he cut it from 39.6 uh, to 28.6. So that's a big one to pass through. Now some of the companies are pass through, some of them aren't. But those are major taxes. We got rid of we got rid of a global tax system. We were the only country in the OECD to have a global tax system. Let me take you what, through what that meant. U.S. company and German company in Ireland competing like man for business. Okay. Both of us competing. Both companies make 100 bucks in profits. Right? Both companies are liable for taxation in Ireland, and both of them have to pay the Irish government $12.5 for their 12.5% corporate tax rate in Ireland. Okay? For the German company, that's the end of it. They have a territorial tax system, which means if you paid your taxes where you earned your profits, that's it. You don't owe anyone any more money. U.S., on the other hand, that we have a global system, which means after you pay the $12.5 to Ireland, you then owe $22.5 to the U.S. government in addition to the Irish tax to bring it up to $35. We had that global tax. We got rid of that global tax. It makes us totally non-competitive in the rest of the world. We got rid of that global tax, and we've moved to a territorial tax like every other country in the OECD. I don't know if you're all aware. We also went, uh, <clears throat> we also went to 100 percent expensing. 100 percent of capital expenditures. Now, that doesn't change depreciation at all, but it accelerates depreciation to all of it in the first year. It changes the internal rate of return on investment. It is enormously beneficial to the accretion of capital for investments to increase productivity, output, growth, and, and, and prosperity. It's an amazingly powerful thing, 100 percent expensive. That's an amazing feat for him to have done. In addition to that, we also got rid of this, well, not got rid of, we limited the state and local tax deductions. Do you, let me tell you what that means. Uh, a state with the highest income tax rate of 10 percent would be able to do deduct that tax on the federal tax return and therefore pay 4 percent less in taxes for the amount they deducted. Let's say it's $10. Uh, they deducted on the federal tax return, and that means they got $4 back on that. So the net cost to a, per, to a state that has a $10 tax would be only $6 to the taxpayer in that state. By limiting that, what we've done is we've made states pay the taxes their states required and not have it subsidized by all the other states that don't have those tax deductions. This is one of the most wonderful things that has happened, is the capping of the SALT deduction. And lastly, if I, if I can say, uh, we've gotten rid of the individual mandate on the ACA. Now, you are taxed if you don't buy government insurance. <laughs> Does that make any sense to any of you? Well, we've gotten rid of the mandate. This is the tax bill that went through. In my view, this is probably the second best tax bill in the last 50 years. It's just an astoundingly good tax bill in there. If you look at some of the other stuff in monetary policy, we had all the Princeton professors running the Fed, and they, Bernanke and, and, and Janet Yellen doing this, and they kept interest rates zero. The reason they kept interest rates zero is they would say, well, at zero interest rates, we'll have a lot more mortgages, we'll have a lot more investments because it's easier to borrow. At zero interest rates makes the thresholds lower, and that increases investments in housing. And that, with the multiplier, will lead to an increase in output employment production. You, you with me on that? That's what the, exactly what the Keynesians say on that. What they don't realize is no one's willing to lend any money. How much would you lend? to a risky homeowner who buys a home with 90 percent mortgage for 30 years at 3 percent? No one. There was no supply of funds going to these markets. And without the supply of funds, we had the lowest amount of new housing starts per 10,000 population in the last nine years than we've had in our history of the United States. We know none of the money. The reason we got no home starts is because interest rates were too low. You don't want them too high. You don't want them too low. You want them just right where demand equals supply. That's where they get the equilibrium thing. And what we and what President has done, and I talked to him about Powell, he said, what do you think about Powell? I think he's great. He's not a professor, which gives him a great uphand uh, on, on, on Bernanke and Yellen. You know, professors think they're right. And they never are. That's me too. 
uh, I, I think uh, I, I think it was Irving Crystal who put it perfectly. He said that um, uh, it takes a PhD in economics not to be able to understand the obvious. <laughs> uh, that's my favorite quote. You got it there. But we've got much better monetary policy. Uh, I went through trade policy with you a little bit. Uh, we've got this trade negotiations going on. I believe Trump is trying to get this to much lower tariffs. We have one area that's uh, really difficult right now is spending. Uh, if you look at the five pillars of economic growth, uh, a low rate, broad based flat tax, we've moved in that direction nicely. Spending restraint, we've not moved in that direction. Uh, deregulation, we've moved in that direction nicely. Monetary policy, I think we're moving very nicely in that direction as well. Uh, free trade, I think the, 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 the verdict is still out, but I think we are moving. We just got a good deal with Mexico and Canada. Even little baby Trudeau came on down to a mountain and said, I sign now. Okay, we had that. Uh, we have one with South Korea. We've had some other ones. We've got some other big ones going on the list there. But of the five pillars, low rate, broad based flat tax, spending restraint, sound money, free trade, minimal regulations, four out of the five, I'm going to argue, are in good territory. The fifth one is spending. We have it go. Uh, I am more than excited about what's happening in this country if you look at the very, very early evidence. And it really is very early. And I, I would not rely on it at all. But we've had finally a couple of good quarters of real GDP growth. Uh, we have a prospect of another quarter coming in in the next week or so uh, of being okay, not bad. We need to have years of growth uh, before we can offset the damage that was done by W and Obama. We have a long way to go. But I think the early signs are that we are getting some prosperity coming along the lines. And I, I, and I couldn't be more excited than I am about what's happening in, in the U.S. I guess uh, what, I, what I'm trying to say really is, um, you know, hold on to your hats. The policies are coming in place. The things are changing. The election here is really important. Uh, but in my view, I think that the best is yet to come. And we've got a good prosperity in the makings for this country going forward. And I'm going to end with one story, if I can, with the real president. Can I, can I do that? This is my favorite story. Of course, the real president you still know is none other than Ronald Reagan. True story. He and Mrs. Reagan used to come out uh, to California from Washington. They'd fly out and they'd go to Rancho del Cielo, you know, up there in Santa Barbara, up in the mountains there. And he'd ride his horse and he'd chop some wood and do that. And then what they'd do is have the helicopter would bring them down to Los Angeles. And they would go to the Century Plaza Hotel. Now, the Century Plaza is that big curved one on Century Boulevard, the big curved hotel there. But there's the annex in the back, which is a square building. And the top two floors of the annex uh, is the presidential suite for the Century Plaza Hotel. They'd land the helicopter on the roof there, blah, 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 land. And they, and they would get together with the old members of the kitchen cabinet, all the oldsters. I was then a young kid. I wasn't allowed to go to the grown-ups parties. Um, <clears throat> but they'd get together, uh, and they'd go to Chasen's and have dinner. But before they go to Chasen's and have dinner, they'd invite two or three of us up there to the presidential uh, suite at the hotel. And they'd, we'd have drinks for maybe an hour and chat and stuff like that. And then the grown-ups would go away and uh, have their dinner at Chasen's. And this one occasion, it was right after the U.S. invaded Grenada. Do you remember that? All right. I, I know nothing about international economics, but it excites the living bejabers out of me. I love it. Tell me the story. I want to know what happened. Oh, right. American troops on the soil, foreign communist troops on the soil, bang, 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 shooting. Kill. I mean, it's really exciting. It was the first time in years that that had happened. And the president was walking around. It was just a small group, 15, 20. 20 people, and I cornered the president. He had just made his drink du jour. Uh, I think they call it a screwdriver. It's an orange juice and vodka. If you know, I guess you, you can't smell the alcohol, but it, it makes you feel good. <laughs> and he was just that, and I cornered him. And I said, sir, you got to tell me, how did you make that decision to go into Grenada? you got to tell me how you did. Surely, 
uh, it wasn't a two minute, where one minute's no, the next minute's yet, and that two minute interval, you made up your decision and fell. You gotta tell me, sir, how did you make that decision? I swear to God, he looks at me and he says, with his drink in his one hand, he goes, well, Art, um, I just asked myself, what would John Wayne have done? And if you think about it for two seconds, it's the right answer. <laughs> if you were to do what the guy with the white hat was scripted to do, that's the right thing to do. Thank you very much for allowing me to be here with all of you. And I'm... Yeah. And I have had a wonderful time with all of you, and I just can't thank you enough for being so hospitable. But now... The so now we have an opportunity for a Q&A with Dr. Laffer. So if I could get the tech folks to come on up, we're going to move the podium to I'm the fine. side. I'm You're fine. fine. Oh, you want to stand? Okay. Then we'll, uh, so there's a microphone right on the side. There should be a microphone here in the middle. Uh, so if you all would just file behind those microphones and ask questions, that would be wonderful. Don't be shy. Oh, I love Yay! Yay! I'm too tall for this thing. Okay, uh, thanks Dr. Laffer for coming to talk to us. Um, you mentioned briefly that you think that Trump is actually moving us towards lower tariffs, um, even though obviously he's espoused some degree of protectionism and he's engaged in some, like several low key trade wars. So I've heard like the outlines of the argument of why that's like some sort of long-term strategy to actually get our tariffs lower. And it seems like you insinuated that that's what you think he's doing. Could you defend that position, explain how he plans I, to do I can't that? defend a position. I'm, I'm not in the negotiations. Sure. I'm, I'm, I'm just a professor. I'm just a theoretician there. When people negotiate, I get very scared. I curl up in a fetal position and climb under my bed and I cry. Uh, you know, I, I don't like confrontations. I'm not good at it. Uh, but I'll tell you what he told me. Sounds good. All right. He told me uh, on the phone, he said, you know, Art, I'm a free trader. And I said, yes, I do know that, sir. Uh, I've known Trump for a number of years. Not well, just bumping into him. Uh, he and I both did a lot of work with GE, and I would be at the opening of a hotel or something like that, and he would be there. I, I never had a long conversation with him at all. But uh, he, he told me, he said, I told him that, you know, I do understand you're a free trader. Anyone who own, run, owns and runs an international business has to be a free trader. You have to know to outsource your expenses to the highest quality, lowest cost location and sell your products in the best profit margin location. And that's what international businesses do. And they all love to have the access to all of these markets and be able to do that correctly. So it's very intuitive to me that he is a free trader. I then added in the conversation to him, I said, also, sir, I know you're a free trader because you imported two foreign wives. And uh, <laughs> I, he didn't laugh quite as much as I thought he should have. I thought it was a funny line. You got to admit, it's a pretty funny line. <laughs> but he did laugh a little bit. And he, I said, I know you're a free trader. He said, I am a free trader, totally. But what am I going to do? All of these other countries have much higher tariffs, much higher protectionism than we do. Now, that's not true of the little bitty tiny places like Hong Kong or Monaco or some of these others, Jersey, Guernsey, and so You know, these types of places. But of the major countries in the world, the U.S. is the most free trade country of them all. Some of these countries, like Japan, are terribly protectionist. Now, as you know, Arthur, he said, tariffs hurt both the country that imposes the tariffs and it hurts the countries that have the tariffs imposed on them. It's, 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 an, it's an equal opportunity destroyer for everyone. But these countries are mercantilists, and they don't really understand trade or anything at all. So what they believe is they believe that exports are wonderful and imports are terrible. Exports, we get to produce a lot and, and sell it abroad and get jobs. And imports, we consume a lot, but we lose the jobs because foreigners have the jobs. Okay, that's the way these countries look at the world. Uh, they'd love to see us export everything in the world and import nothing and we die of starvation, but boy, did we have jobs. Just uh, trying that one on a little size. The, uh, so this is what he says to me. He said, I, can't, I don't have any leverage over these countries to come make them negotiate to free trade deals. 
The only thing I know is they all love their exports. They love, love, love their exports. So what I've decided to do is put tariffs on their exports until I keep raising those tariffs until they'll come and negotiate free trade. Now that's his strategy. Now uh, whether it's true or not, whether it'll work or not, I don't know, but already it appears to be working uh, with Canada and Mexico. It appears, appears to be working with South Korea. Uh, it looks like it's going to work with some of Europe. Jean Claude Juncker came over to try to negotiate. I know that Trump at the G7 meeting in, in Ottawa, uh, when he left to go to Singapore to meet with uh, Kim Jong un uh, of, of North Korea and Singapore, when he left, he went and he said to the other six countries there, he said, Look at deal right today. The U.S. will eliminate all tariffs and all non tariff barriers if you guys agree to do it too. There was no response whatsoever. So this is his strategy. I don't mean to say it's good or bad. I don't understand strategies. That's not what I do. But it, it makes it, it rings true, and it looks like it might be successful. That's why I, say, I still say the, the hand's not finished yet. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a policy in the making. But that's what he said. And I think that was quite a while ago, and it's, he's been following that strategy uh, for quite a while. And I believe it has a real good chance of working, but who am I to know about strategies? That light, is there any way of cutting that light out? Just turning it the other way, that beam? I feel like Roy Orbison. <laughs> Remember he always wears sunglasses when he performed? Never mind, never mind. Go ahead, ask the question. Oh, you'll come over to this one's fine. I can. <coughs> Yay! Hi. So, um, my question is, uh, <coughs> sorry, the um, the idea of cutting taxes in order to promote growth and supply side economics. A lot of that uh, depends on the notion that um, when you allow the very rich to accumulate more wealth, it will help the entire economy. So um, I was just wondering how you would respond to, um, there have been some empirical studies like from the International Monetary Fund, for example, that seem at least on their face to kind of contradict that premise, that claim that when the top 20% uh, gets wealthy, the wealth really just kind of stays there if you look at all countries across the globe and do studies on them. So do you know about these studies and how would you respond to them? Sure, I, I know about the studies. I, that's what I do. I, <laughs> uh, and let me just say, it is a very, very heated debate that has been going on for a long time with Monsieur Piketty, Thomas Piketty of France in the book Capital. You can go through. There are a lot of studies out there. I've done a compilation of 350 of the academic studies on taxes and corporate especially, but personal income taxes as well. And you know, it is across the board on the results of those. Uh, I'm going to tell you, I think the preponderance of evidence is very much in favor of cutting tax rates to create economic growth and to reduce economic inequality. Now, economic inequality um, is in greatly improved uh, by economic growth. And I think the tax studies across the board, tax rate reductions do lead to ra more rapid economic growth. And if you look in the U.S. history, uh, you can see what I said on the Eisenhower era. The first thing Eisenhower did was veto Bob Taft's tax cuts. We had very slow growth during the 50s, uh, 52 through 60. John F. Kennedy, as you know, cut the highest marginal income tax rate from 91 percent to 70 percent. Uh, he cut the lowest rate from 20 to 14 percent. He cut the corporate rate from 52 to 48 percent. He tried to cut it to 46 percent, but thank God Barry Goldwater and all the Republicans blocked him from that irresponsible move. Uh, Bob Dole voted against cutting the highest tax rate from 91 percent to 70 percent because Bob Dole argued that we couldn't afford the revenue losses. If you don't find that humorous, I don't know what is. Uh, but they did it there. Kennedy also put in the investment tax credit for you, first time in U.S. history, 7 percent investment tax credit, shortened depreciable lives for plant and equipment expenditures. Uh, you know, if you look at all of this stuff, we had enormous growth during the Kennedy go-go 60s, I believe, because of the tax cuts, sound money that he had in free trade. If you'll remember, Kennedy did the Kennedy round tariff negotiation, which is a 34 percent cut in global tariffs. That uh, The average annual growth rate during the Kennedy years was 5.19 percent per year, average annual compound growth rate. That's one high growth rate. Then we got what I call ref referred to you as the period of the Four Stooges. 
Johnson, Nixon, Ford, and Carter tax increases. You remember Johnson's tax surcharge, you, uh, wage and price controls, all of this stuff that were done there that whole period, almost no growth whatsoever during that 16-year period. And then you got Ronnie. Oh my God, boom. If you look at the history of the U.S., the time series history chronological, I think the evidence is really strong that tax reductions lead to very rapid economic growth and prosperity. Uh, I think if you look at the states, those states with the highest growth rates have the lowest tax rates and, and vice versa. Uh, I think even internationally, if you look at countries, uh, those countries with good pro-growth uh, tax policies and, and regulatory policies do much better than countries that are old line, big spending to high tax states. My view of the evidence. Uh, I think this evidence, you know, will be battled on for a long time, but the one I like most of all was Obama's chief economist. Uh, her husband, by the way, Christina Romer, uh, was Obama's chief economist. Um, she and her husband, Paul Romer, who just yesterday got the Nobel Prize in economics, shared it with, uh, uh, with Bill Nordhaus at Yale, shared it there. They did the study on, corporate t on income tax cuts that was the most extreme version of the pro-growth agenda I have ever heard in my life, the best study I've ever seen. It makes me look like a real negative one on taxes, that I should want to higher taxes. They, they found that growth to be very high. I think that's one of the best articles I've ever seen on economic growth and tax cuts. So my view is the literature is very supportive of the pro-growth agenda, but we'll just have to keep debating this on for years. But, but that's what academics are supposed to do. Uh, and now we'll see what happens with, with uh, President Trump and see what the results are following these policies. Yes. Thank you so much for coming. I have sort of two questions. The first is, you talked a lot about certain presidents having a large amount of economic success, uh, discussing Clinton, and then a Had large- a lot of what? Economic success. Yes. Uh, uh, Clinton being a good one in this respect, Nixon being a very bad one in this respect. How much credit can we give to individual presidents for the success or the failure of economics in their time? Because yeah. a lot, for instance, yeah. Obama taking credit sure. for what's happening here. That's a question that I'm not an expert on who actually gets the credit, who doesn't. Uh, if you look at it, uh, what we have always done is we've attributed to the policies to the president. Now, Ronald Reagan, bless his soul, uh, had a Democratic House when he was president, controlled that. The Democratic House was very helpful with us in getting our tax bills passed. Uh, the first bill we had, which was the spending bill, was Graham Lotta. Phil Graham was a Democratic House member uh, from House Budget. He did it with Lotta, Adele Lotta, who was also in the Budget Committee. The two of them together proposed the spending limitations. Uh, we had the tax rate reduction, which was done with Kent Hance, who was a Democrat on House Ways and Means Committee from Lubbock, Texas, had Lujan's old district there in Texas. It was him, and he did it with Barbara Conable. That was the bill. So, you know, you have all of these players in there. What we do as shorthand, as economists, and I think almost all of us do it, not just economists, is attribute the success to the president. Uh, do I believe it was all Obama's fault? No. But it was Obama's reign, and do I believe it was all Ronald Reagan's credit? No. Uh, but uh, I give credit to Reagan, I give credit to Clinton, and I give credit to Obama and W as well. That's why we do it. Thank Does you. that a fair enough answer for you? I, I think so, at least you know, as far as we Shane all know goes. what to what Newt Gingrich did when he was head of the House. You know, he worked with Clinton, and you know, he and Bill Clinton worked miracles together. I mean, what Clinton didn't do was amazing. I mean, yes, he did raise the two highest tax rates. That's true. Done. I think it was a big mistake, but he did it. Uh, but what Clinton did is he put in the he cut taxes on the elderly. He got rid of the retirement test on Social Security. That was an amazing thing there. He got rid of the uh, uh, needs test, means test on, on Social Security. He he got uh, he cut government spending as a share of GDP by more than the next four best uh, peacetime presidents in U.S. history. I mean, Clinton did the biggest capital gains tax cut in U.S. history, eliminating capital gains taxation from owner-occupied homes. That's amazing. Welfare reform, that you actually have to look for a job to get welfare. I mean, that's a concept. I mean, it, it is amazing. It is amazing what Clinton did. I mean, I voted for Clinton twice. I thought he was a great president. Uh, and I would vote for him again, Bill.
Uh, but I thought he was a great president. And give him credit for it. Now, was it Newt Gingrich or Bill Clinton? I, I, I don't parse out those differences. I just give it credit to the president. The second question I has ha have has to do with Social Security. Yeah. Um, how long is it, do you believe, that we can maintain a system paying in with a smaller number to a larger number of the elderly? Is it something that yeah. we actually can sustain, or is it something that eventually will just implode? Be careful. Uh, be very careful on how you, uh, the assumptions that you impose upon yourself. By the, what you do is look at Social Security. You take a demographic projection out into the future. You take that Social Security system out, and then you look at the deficits, the unfunded liabilities, all of that stuff, and we run out of money in 2028 and stuff. Let me tell you what we had when we came into office. On January 20th, 1981, we took office. At that time, according to the Saltonstall report, the unfunded liabilities of U.S. Social Security was about 1.2 times annual GDP. That was the unfunded liabilities. Horrible. Projections out were just massively bad. What we did was we did a couple of things. We did the tax cuts to create economic growth. All right, now, by having economic growth, what that meant is there were more people employed, they were paying into their payroll taxes, which are Social Security taxes, and economic growth helps the funding of Social Security, number one. Number two, we cut Social Security benefits. Now, we didn't just cut them, but we subjected half of the Social Security benefits to the income tax. All that is is cutting benefits, all right? How you did it, what form you used, but we just cut benefits. That made it more fundable, all right? What we also did was we extended the age of retirement from 65 to 67. Now, that we extended out in the years, but that was a huge reduction. And do you remember any of the riots that occurred back then? Oh, no one else does either. They didn't. We just took care of it below the surface and did. There are lots of things when these unfunded liabilities and these problems start getting very large and start looming, you find all sorts of creative ways of solving them. And I just beg you that when necessity comes about, believe me, they'll, tr they'll find ways of getting control, I believe, of these things. And don't let yourself lose sleep at night. Work on trying to find out ways of solving it, but don't take it too seriously until it happens. You with me? Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks so much for coming out tonight. Um, How tall are you? <laughs> <Got it. laughs> yeah. Um, you mentioned the massive difference between the what? The massive difference between um, the national debt and the um, trade deficit, and I was really fascinated that the trade deficit is actually a good thing. But uh, how serious is our national debt, and how can yeah. we fix it? This is somewhat similar to the, uh, to the first guy's question just in front of you. Uh, the national debt is very serious. I'd much prefer to have lower debt than higher debt. But let me just say there is no way of solving the debt problem without economic growth, period. You, cannot, you can't balance the budget on the backs of the unemployed and people who leave your jurisdiction. You just can't do it. So my first and foremost agenda is to create the economic growth uh, to be able to bring that debt back under control. Then you can get your hands on entitlements and on government spending and really make a major difference. But it really is economic growth is the way to bring debt under control. But the debt problem is very serious. It's not a joke. But there is no magic wand. There's, there's only one magic wand which does work, and I don't think anyone really wants to do it, is just default on it. It's just say, eh, the U.S. isn't going to pay it anymore, it's over. That's a little scary, but that does solve the problem really quickly. <laughs> you, you follow what I'm saying? But what I would do is not, I would not obsess on the debt, I would not obsess on the unfunded liabilities. They are serious problems. But, but you're obsessing on them won't solve them. What you need to do is try to grab yourself the solution, which is economic growth. You know, and as the GDP grows, uh, as the GDP grows rapidly, more rapidly, debt as a share of GDP declines, and it, it does come under control. It takes quite a while. That's why I'm not touting the economic growth that we've had so far as being the solution, wow, yay. We've got a long way to go to bring this economy back into good shape. It, it's not going to be solved in six months, a year, a year and a half, two years. We've got a long period of prosperity we need to bring us back under control.
Okay, thank you. I also thank you very much, Dr. Laffer, for coming here. Um, my question is, you'd mentioned the five pillars of economic success, I think, as you put it. Um, and the one that you mentioned that still is maybe not implemented specifically yet is uh, spending, uh, the is issue of spending. And could you explain a little bit more what the specific benefits are of cutting spending and how that works? Is it simply just sure. that uh, taxation and national debt can be dealt with better, or uh, is there more to it? Let me, let me go through the, the theory of the government in a very quick little, little way. Uh, government spending, as my colleague Milton Friedman always said, is taxation, and it is. The only way the government can spend money is by taking it from other people. Now, what matters is how you spend your money, how you collect your taxes, and how much money you collect and spend. Those are the three fiscal issues you look at. And, and when you look at that situation, you know, the key one here is government spending is total taxation, and what you want is restraint on that. You can have too little spending, too, by the way. You know, when you think about it, and let me, if I can, all taxes are bad. All of them are bad. Some are worse than others. What you want to do is you want to collect your revenues from the least bad taxes. And you want to spend your money on the best projects. All right? That's what you'd like to do. Collect your money in the least bad taxes and spend your money on the most beneficial. When the damage done by the last dollar of taxes collected it's a beep, 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 less than the benefit done by the last dollar of government money spent, you stop already. That's where government should be. If it's less than that, we've got government that's too small. We've got more than that, we've got government that's too large. That's where we should be. And government spending today, my view, is too large. It's spent on a lot of frivolous things, and it's not spent very well. I mean, I tell people, if you tax people who work and you pay people who don't work, do I need to say the next sentence to you? No. I mean, that's where I would put it that right now on, on, on government. But you want to control government spending because it is total taxes. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Leffer, for uh, coming to speak to us tonight. Uh, so my question was, um, how do you, um, do you view the uh, taxes cuts that local municipalities or states have given to certain companies, basically picking winners or losers yeah. um, that they, that they want to draw to their states? Do you see that as a fair tax, or is that something the government yeah. should just These are the subsidies to bringing business into the state. Correct. It's yeah. a tub of corruption. It's all it is. It's just really bad, bad business. Uh, if you give a break to a company coming into your state, do you give a break to a company that doesn't leave your state? <laughs> you know, it, it's just, and when a governor, governor and the, his cabinet and all get their little hands on that money, it goes to their friends. You know, it is just ripe with corruption. Uh, and you know, state and local governments are very, very potentially corrupt because of the local operation with the money. Um, I just did one in Missouri. Let, let me just describe to you Missouri, if I can, just a little problem. In Missouri, now think of this. In Missouri, there are 2,339 separate sales tax jurisdictions in that state. This is true. 2,339, that's as of eight months ago. There are more now. In each one of the, those are separate sales tax jurisdictions. In each one of those sales tax jurisdictions, there are up to eight separate authorities allowed, legally allowed, to impose a sales tax. On average, 4.7 separate entities impose sales taxes in the average jurisdiction in Missouri. Now, let me just say that again. 2,339 separate sales tax jurisdictions and up to eight separate potential taxing authorities in each of those jurisdictions. You, you follow me there? But that's not all of it. There are something like 15 separate sales tax schedules depending upon the product that is being taxed. 
Bibles are taxed at different rates than groceries are, than restaurants are, ba ba doo doo dee 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 15 separate categories of sales tax schedules in 2,339 districts with 4.7 separate taxing authorities on average. Now that's not the end of it yet either. There are separate categories of buyers that have separate sales tax schedules as well. 501c3s, like universities, don't have to pay some sales taxes. Some sales taxes can't, don't have to be paid by, but there are 25 separate categories for different purchasers. Listen to this operation. This is what is actually in Missouri today, and you wonder why that state is collapsing right before your very eyes. You know, there were a number of tax jurisdictions in Missouri that collected more than 30% of their total revenues from fees, fines, and levies. I mean, there's speeding tickets going in and taking. Over 30% of their revenues was this. They, the Missouri passed a law that you can't collect more than 30% of your revenues from fees. So you know where these districts are. They're right in the middle of the, of the worst neighborhoods. They're in Ferguson, all of these other. It's a catastrophe what's happening. If you look at property taxes in, 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 in Jefferson County, Louisville, Kentucky, which I'd done the state tax reform there, it's incredible how many different property taxes there are. Moving cars, company, tra school districts. It's, it's, what I want to tell you is that this is just a catastrophic problem that is bringing down the whole system. When you look at investigating fraud, you've got to have at least a million, a million dollars worth of damage to ever allocate time for revenuers and, and government agents to go in and check for fraud. But to commit fraud, you only need a couple of hundred bucks. There are 1,440 separate income taxes in Ohio. You know, when you ask for problems on the state and local level, you, you've got real, real problems going on there. And I don't know how to solve these. Missouri has put their sales tax issue in the Constitution. So now you've got to do a constitutional amendment to even be able to look at the sales. I, I, I don't know, I'm just throwing up my hands. I'm working with Missouri, but it's, it's really hard. That answer? Yes, thank you so okay, much. I, I, may, I don't mean to discourage you people in this stuff. I, I talk about taxes on a, on a level there of, of, in, of, of a talk and how incentives matter. But when you dig down into the thing, you've got corruption all over the place. And one of the biggest tubs of corruption is the governor's mansion having authority to pay companies to come in by deleting, not having their taxes, or having Virginia Vest. We have 10 Vest in Tennessee. Guess who gets the 10 Vest money? <clears throat> yeah, you got it. Those people who shouldn't have it. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Laffer, for coming here. It was a pleasure helping to organize this event. Thank and you. Uh, great to hear your, your thoughts on our current economics. Thank you. Uh, so my question was, uh, I would tend to agree with you that there is an inherent danger in a skyrocketing national debt. However, some people would uh, compare the debt in its effects to something like the, the deficit in capital surplus and that, oh, other countries are basically pouring money into us and we're pouring money into them. And so the effect is really the same, that there's no real danger in accumulating a massive debt. Could you address those concerns perhaps in a little bit more detail? Yeah, I thought I'd, I, I tried to make that the diff distinction. The, the, the trade deficit, uh, you know, is, is not your problem. The trade debt, it's not. It's an individual problem. If you borrow money from me or I borrow money from you, none of the rest of the people in this room have any obligations to pay anything or do anything except for you and me. And that's it. The trade deficit and, and the trade debt are exactly that issue. They are not a collective liability. They are individual liabilities of the people who engaged in making the, the, the borrowing and lending. The national debt is a collective liability because it's a liability of our government. The trade deficit is not a liability of our government or of the Chinese government, for that matter. So that's why they're totally different. And so when you hear people talk about the twin deficits, and the de it's a different animal altogether. And the trade deficit is not something to worry about. The national deficit is. It's a real problem, as you can see from the other questions. And could you perhaps explain, uh, on, that, on that note, could you perhaps explain why the, the national debt is such a problem? Why having that liability? Yeah, is because uh, you know, because we owe the money, and we comes out of taxpayers' funds. Uh, you and I are paying taxes, 
and we owe the money, we owe the interest on the debt. Um, and it's eating a larger and larger share of our total tax take, especially if interest rates rise, as they will for sure. And that's why it's a real problem for us, is it takes away from our ability to do other projects, but more importantly, it causes our tax rates to rise and become crippling to the economic growth. Thank you. Okay. We have time for two more questions. Oh, okay. Um, I actually have two questions, but one of them is short, <laughs> so I, I promise I won't take both of them. Um, uh, I love it. I love it. Yeah, Good. I to thank you no, for congratulations. That's, yeah. that's a line I'm going to steal. Yeah. So um, I want to thank you for coming here from uh, Tennessee. I'm actually from just outside of Nashville as well. So, oh, are you? Where? Yeah. Uh, well, north of Murfreesboro. Where? Dor north of Murfreesboro. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. So um, first of all, I was wondering, um, so you talked a lot about how, you know, spending obviously something we need to work on, the five pillars of government. Why is it that you think that President Trump hasn't really addressed as much? Is that because of a lack of willingness on his part or maybe Congress hasn't gotten on board? No. Or why do you think that's something that we haven't been doing as well on? Spending is a very difficult problem to organize, structure, and get political consensus on and get a budget that really cuts spending dramatically. You have all sorts of interests in there, and I'm not going to call them special interests, but they're, they're interests that are involved in government spending, and they survive on those monies. And it really requires a whole different level of political ability to be able to do that. And uh, you can do taxes much easier, you can do regulations much easier, you can do trade deals much easier, you can do monetary policy much easier, but spending is a whole bigger, much bigger political problem to deal with and it's not something you want to take on as your first task. That's, it's just political reality of getting a budget through that cuts spending a lot with all these people screaming and hollering is very hard. You saw what happened when, when Scott Walker tried to do that in Wisconsin, the pickets in the, in the hill. It's just really tough stuff. So I believe he has put it on hold until he gets the other stuff done, gets that economic growth going, and then he will try to address the spending. And it really requires it really requires cutting, you know, reducing, uh, uh, re reducing entitlements. I mean, everyone wants to make sure we have enough monies to spend on people who need the money. But when your entitlement programs get so large and become so attractive that they create the very problems that are being used to explain, to ra rationalize why you have these programs, entitlement programs that are too large create the very poverty that uh, uh, that rationalizes the the use of more funds and you can see this in so many ways i use the example today but it's in philadelphia a single mother uh hits income of twenty seven thousand dollars a year now she's granted all sorts of needs test means test and income test supplements to her income all right at twenty seven thousand dollars if she starts earning any more money she loses these supplements between $27,000 and $57,000 a year. That single mother, paying the laws precisely, will be worse off earning more money. And that holds you, I mean, you effectively tax rates of over 100% between $27,000 and $57,000 a year income for a single mother. It, it's a killer. And that's what you have with entitlement programs. You've got to go in there and, and clean these rat nests out. And, and make sure that the system is rational and creates still strong incentives for growth. And that takes a lot more than these other bills do. I hope that answers. Yeah, that really does. And my second one, kind of quicker. Um, sure. A little, maybe a little more frivolous. So do you have any good Trump stories in the Senate, kind of the same way that you do? I do. Reagan stories? Yeah. Would you, but not, those that but you not should, tonight. That, that seems fair. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Trump, Trump, Trump is a very entertaining person. And in economics, he's been amazingly good. And I want to make sure you understand it's economics I'm talking about all the time. I have never seen a better administration in my life than this administration in the first term. And he's not even halfway through it. Now, we'll see what happens there. But Trump is a very, very different type of person than I've ever seen in my life in politics. Never seen anything like this. And uh, we'll see how it, how it unfolds. But go ahead. So a couple of questions ago, you mentioned that all taxes are bad, but some are less bad. Can you explain Exaggerated. which? Sin taxes are probably good. So, <laughs> we, we, so can you explain we Americans which don't ones are good taxes well, yeah, or, or better taxes? I'll tell you. Yeah, I'll tell you. Uh, yeah, I'll do two with you. One is we Americans 
don't really like drunk people smoking while they shoot each other. Um, sin taxes are a very small amount of revenues. Let me tell you how I designed a tax bill that was used by Governor Brown. Uh, I did Jerry Brown's flat tax when he ran for president in 1992 against Bill Clinton. Um, he is a very good friend. Uh, he was very good with Prop 13, with you know all this stuff in the 70s and 80s. He was just spectacular, great governor. Uh, he was running for president in 1992. There were eight candidates in the Democratic Party. He was number eight out of the eight. Uh, he told, called me. He said, "I've got a terrible problem. I've limited myself to no more than a hundred dollars contribution from any contributor. How stupid is that?" And I said, "You're right up there." And he, um, he says, I've done that. I'm eighth in the candidate. If another candidate entered the race, I'd be ninth. Uh, you know, it's, I need a Hail Mary. And I said, well, come on down to San Diego and let us talk. Came down there, spent three days the weekend. And I'd written this paper long ago, but it was called the complete flat tax. What we did, is, well, what I did on the tax bill that he ran on, was we got rid of all federal taxes. All of them. We got rid of the personal income tax gone. We got rid of the corporate tax. Gone. Got rid of all payroll taxes, both employer and employee. Gone. Got rid of the capital gains tax. Got rid of the unearned income tax. Got rid of the death tax. All of them. Gone. Got rid of excise taxes. Got rid of all tariffs. Got rid of all federal taxes, except for sin taxes. Now, the little sin tax was just about 2% of all tax revenue. And the reason, by the way, you don't want to get rid of sin taxes is their purpose is not so much to raise revenues as it is to change behavior. Okay, that's why you have them. So they're not a revenue raise. The other taxes are supposedly to raise revenues. All right, we got rid of all of those. And in their stead, we replaced all federal taxes with two flat rate taxes, a flat tax rate on net business sales or which you guys would probably call it a VAT tax if you were Europeans, it'd be a VAT tax, uh, and a flat tax on personal unadjusted gross income with almost no deductions. All right, those two flat taxes. And then what we did was we taxed the first dollar to the last dollar at the same rate on both those taxes, and we taxed both bases at the same tax. Now, if you'll notice what I've done here is I'm taxing GDP once when it's spent that's what a VAT tax is. So that's 100% of GDP. And then I have taxed GDP a second time when it's earned, which is all income. One's the debit and one's the credit of the same transaction. You, you follow me there? So I'm taxing GDP twice. The tax rate that came out static revenue neutral. All right, no Laffer curve effect, no, no dynamics, none of that stuff effect, okay? The tax rate that came out static revenue neutral was 11.8%, which I rounded up to 12%. Okay, 12% tax on a VAT, 12% tax on a personal unadjusted gross income. You with me? That's it. Now, if you add them to the two together, it should come out to approximately 24%. Now, actually, at full employment, federal taxes are a little bit more than 20% of GDP, but there are lots of things you can't tax which make up for the difference. For example, profits of government-run corporations, uh, they, you can't get those because those are embedded in the numbers there. The imputed rental value of owner-occupied homes, that's not in, you know, there, there are a bunch of things in there which takes it down to about a 12% tax on each. Now, Jerry Brown decided that he'd like to have a little bit more money, he said, to reduce the national debt. Um, I think it's more likely he wanted to spend a little bit more. Uh, but whatever, he, he made it 13% flat tax. And some of you may remember Jerry Brown's 13% flat tax that he ran on. He was eighth in the race when he started. He went after Clinton. This is the year Clinton was nominated. He went after Clinton tooth and nail with this flat tax in the Democratic primary full of all the lefties there are in the world. He went from eighth in the race to second in the race. Uh, not only was he second in the race, we had Clinton on the ropes. He was in our crosshairs. He cooked goose. We had him, and it was really exciting. Jerry Brown had just mauled Bill Clinton in the Democratic primary. Uh, we had just won the primaries in Connecticut and in Oregon. And we were coming into the big ones, New York and California. And we had this guy on the ropes. We were just about to do the, the knockout punch. Three weeks out of the New York primary, Jerry Brown decided to announce Jesse Jackson as his running mate. 
the poles go just the other way. You know, and, and I sat there and wondered, why did, Jesse, why did Jerry Brown do this? Now, as it ended up, we were number two. We got the second largest number of delegates with a complete flat tax. How's that for lovely pro-growth agenda? The, the reason Jerry Brown did that was because he really didn't want to be president. He loved running for president. It was fun. He could yell and scream. But then showing up for the job is something he really didn't want to do. <laughs> it's, he was like Bill Buckley. If you remember Bill Buckley, he ran for mayor of New York. Uh, the reporter asked him, Mr. Buckley, uh, if you win the race, what's the first thing you'll do? And he said, demand a recount. <laughs> uh, but, you know, what I'm telling you is the flat tax that I've just described is really popular everywhere. Richard Vetter, who's an economist from Ohio, uh, took the flat tax, my flat tax to Russia. They put in the 13% flat tax in Russia, exactly the Jerry Brown one, raised tons of revenues, created growth. I mean, it is so obviously correct. Is it not? You know, if you make 10 times as much money as I do, you should pay 10 times as much as I do in taxes. You know? We all should be in the same tub together and all be responsible for taxes. No? And, well, that's what Jerry Brown did. That's the way I would do my tax system today. Uh, and I think we are moving closer and closer to that every day. Uh, I couldn't be more optimistic about the U.S. than I am. At the end of World War II, we had 92.5% tax rate. We're down to a 37% tax rate. Now, we went down a little bit further, but we went up a little bit. But we're going to go down further. Believe me, we've broadened the tax base. We've made huge improvements. This country is improving its economics on a daily basis. You look at the flips and flops and that, but the long run, we are going. We've gotten rid of the forced union states everywhere. More than half the states in the United States now are right to work states. If you look at the death tax, uh, every state in the United States had a death tax except Nevada. 30 years ago. Now, less than half of them have a death tax. I mean, we're making huge, huge progress. What I want, really want to say to you is, you guys are winning the battle. Just keep it going. And if you keep it going, we will get to the real prosperity we deserve and all of you deserve. Thank you very much.